Good morning, YouTube. Josh is here, and oh, <laughs> maybe he's not. He's hiding. Where are you? Oh, there he is. Uh, we're going to take a look at the 458 Eternia and try and fix a few things, including the air conditioner. A few? Well, there. I don't. I don't think we can figure out how to fix a few things. I still have to fix a few things. He's just here. <laughs> If you're new to the channel, my name is Dan and this is my garage. And like I said, this is Josh. And this channel is all about the supercar ownership experience. And this is a terrible example of a supercar ownership experience. Actually, it could be really enjoyable. I don't know, maybe this is the best supercar ownership experience. Mechanically, the car is eh, decent. Cosmetically, it's like a two or three out of 10. And unfortunately, the AC is not working and that's one of those features that probably is desired. So we're gonna try and take a look at that, see what's up. I've already checked that it does have pressure in the system. So that's the extent of my knowledge of AC. So I needed expert help. So Josh is here. Hi Josh. Thanks for ruining my <laughs> day again. You're welcome. We were just admiring all of the interesting damage and stuff that happens to this car. It's fascinating because just little, little things like, you know, this is bent just a tiny bit. And obviously this was bent pretty badly and then reformed in the shape, but uh, other things, you know, we're just kind of looking around and frankly, it's it's impressive that it still dries this well Having seen the damage So this is fun illustration of the conundrum of my business, right yeah. is you guys show up with these cars like oh the cars perfect. It just needs this one thing fixed <laughs> The it looks like this. The problem is for you, ignorance is bliss because you don't f***ing know anything. So even though the car is total dog shit, you have no real reference point. So you show up and you're like, oh, car's fine. It just needs the bumper realigned. Like, no, dude, the f***ing car is totaled. So then how do we explain and get from where it is to where it should be? And at what point do I get tired of working on the car and listening to you, bitch? And at what point do you get tired of spending money? There's basically no way to make this back to an OE level of car. There is, it's just why. So you need to take for reference like restorations, yeah. right? I mean, we can yeah, take a yeah, car with a f***ing VIN number and we can build you an entire car from scratch to better than original specification. That's true. That's true. And you will have the best car you've ever seen. It will cost more than the car originally cost. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, generally you're doing this on a car that's million, two million, three million, you know, right. pick pick right. a million. Yeah, yeah, a rare or something yeah. crazy example. So 500 to a million dollars for a proper, you know, through and through restoration on a car that, you know, has a sellable value of a million plus dollars. So the problem is not that you cannot, it's that because this is not a rare, special, you know, high pedigree, there's nothing, you know, uh, exceptional about this car. You're going to say it's not worth sorting it out because I can go buy this identical car that hasn't been destroyed for, for less money yeah. than it will cost me to buy this car and sort it out properly. So it's not that you can't, it's just the time and energy is easy to discredit as being, you know, worth, worth. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. There's no way you would spend the money to, on this when you could go out and buy a clean example. It would be far more expensive to restore this to any remotely close level as a clean example. Yep. That's the alternate conundrum of the salvage car, right? Is what's the balance of how much money to put into it versus its, its future value. To be fair, like is, even though this thing, you know, we all joke it's been put together by apes and blah, 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 and it's Home Depot hardware and yada, yada. That's what you should do on this, really. This thing was trashed. I mean, it was severely wrecked. So anytime you look at a Ferrari, you think, oh, the insurance company wrote a check to let the owner walk away. Yep. That means that that car is, is gonna... worth more to them in spare parts right. than a running functioning vehicle. True. Same reason why I would never work on this car in my shop because of liability. Yeah, yeah. Every f time you go to drive this car is going to have a problem and you're going to call me and bitch about your problem on a f Sunday afternoon when I also am trying to enjoy myself and the amount of money I'm not going to make 
trying to not <laughs> fix this pile of f***ing trash is not worth a phone call. The only way to do this is like what Dan can do. And you know, I mean- DIY is where it's yeah, at. Yeah, this is a DIY car. You're a handy dude and you can f*** around and you're not rebuilding the engine or painting the car. So you can buy this car and put it in your garage and piece it together in your spare time. And eventually you have a functioning pile of trash that's only an embarrassment to yourself because it's all your own time and money. I would buy this car for myself to go rally it and do track Ferrari club track days and it would be my personal car and I wouldn't care about it because this wouldn't be a representation of my workmanship and all of that. It would literally just be a utensil for my entertainment. I would expect at some point it ends up upside down in a ditch and unrecoverable or on fire. I think everyone's on the same page. Like we have a buyer for this and he agrees. He, he's like, he literally said, I want to daily drive this thing. I want to take it to Walmart. I'm yep. going to drive it to work. I don't, I don't give a shit. Yep. It's that, and that's perfect. That's yep. what this car is. This is now a daily driver. Who gives a shit Ferrari? That's it. Which is kind of cool. Yeah, there, there's a certain magic to it. Josh is uh, flying in the air. Doo -doo -doo. It's not the first time this car has been flying in the air with somebody in it. Nope. Definitely not. Last time the airbags went off. <laughs> we'll try to avoid that today. Do you know this car actually had a tan interior? I was wondering, I saw the fur parts video yeah. yesterday and I was like, that can't be the same car. This car has red interior. They swapped out the uh, interior, I guess. Why would you swap it to red? I don't know. Maybe it was only the only thing available. I would assume like there probably was enough like, you know, replacing the airbags and all that stuff that it probably costs less to buy a new interior than replace the yeah. airbags and whatever. Read data stream. Well, actually, let's go to the faults first. Read fault codes. Yeah. Actuator, air temp sensor, and EVDC. I don't know what EVDC is. So what I'm curious about here, external temperature errors. Yeah. This is fail not present. And then a water temperature status is failed, not present. Mm. So I'm wondering if that's why. There's like some sensors that are not reading or not there. Exactly. So we got an engine temperature reading. So here's the buttons. See this compressor off yeah. LED. So if I hold, see that? That's Wait. me trying to turn the compressor on. Yeah. And then I let go and see how. Oh, it turns off as soon as you let go. So it's like the computer's overriding the signal. Yeah. Saying, I don't want to run. Which is why I suspect that these are our problem is it's basically not getting enough data to agree with the command. The compressor functionality is technically simple, right? It's just, it gets power to the clutch and it locks up and it releases. Wouldn't have anything to do with whether, whether or not the engine's running, would it? Uh, it shouldn't really matter. You should still hear it click. I didn't hear a click. Should I go listen? Uh, if you want to. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Okay, I'm going. Nothing? No. It's got to have pressure in the system. Which it does. To activate the pressure switch. And then other than that, it just references some temperature sensors. Well, that doesn't necessarily make sense. This is negative 40 degrees in the evaporator sensor. That's probably not right. That's probably not right. Yeah, so maybe the control head's just bad because that's a lot of different sensors that have problems. And they're in totally them. different locations. Yeah. It'd be nice if you still had a good 458 no, and then right. we could just swap the heads over real quick and just, you know, because that's a quick and easy verification to see if that's an accurate guess. You know, if we get Yeah, any if all of a sudden we get temperature readings. Because mm -hmm. that's the only other thing to do is check the uh, low pressure switch and make well, sure or the time. or the high pressure switch this is such a ferrari thing to do like you know the data is there the electronics use use the pressure switch but yeah where is it yeah they don't give it to us <laughs> they had to pay extra to add that data to the scan tool so they just didn't bother i assume you've already tried to like clear the faults from the air conditioning unit yeah the, yeah. the the um, recirculation one comes back immediately. Did you ever try the heat to see? Heat does work. Heat does work? Mm hmm Okay. The reading there is filled. Oh. Filled. It's in the green. Your system is filled. So that sh theoretically should be enough for the system to at least function. 
So without uh, me bringing the the pin out and then going through like the control head or whatever and pinning it out to see if we can find any you know high resistance or open circuits through the inputs. Shit, we're kind of stuck. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, we'd do a part swap. Yeah. Of all of the crap I've talked about this car, this Just was, finding the right diameter rotor, yeah, that's a good move. That's actually pretty clever. Kudos Save a on that. ton one. of money there. Well, yeah, because realistically, you guys don't drive these cars enough to need the ceramic brakes. Like, it's really not critical. No. Well, they're all made by Brembo, so... Although, this says Girodis. This is a quality part. This isn't a cheap, you know, this isn't a cheap... Uh, Ho Chi Minh brake rotor kit. Like this is a proper two-piece rotor. Like this was pretty clever. I like this. We're pulling out the trunk liner to get access to the the dryer. Yeah, I want to take a look at the receiver dryer. Yeah. Yeah, we checked the wiring on the actual AC compressor and it doesn't look good. It's not so good, no. No. The uh, main power connector is a little broken and burny. Mm -hmm. And then the high pressure safety switch on the back of the compressor is all kinds of melty and got exposed wires. Fortunately, that rear engine harness is a separate part. It's not integral and it's not terribly expensive. So that is a replaceable component. I'm just not sure if this thing's actually assembled the way it's supposed to be assembled or right. if there's some magic sheetrock screws hiding I would not, I'm not, be, expecting. not be surprised. There's definitely some Home Depot hardware on this. Yeah, me either. That's why I'm just like taking off obvious stuff and then I give it a good yank just to see if there's any surprise hardware. <laughs> surprise hardware. <laughs> surprise! <laughs> Here's a screw where it shouldn't be. <laughs> the good thing is, is everything's already broken so nobody will really notice if I break anything trying right. to figure out how to take it apart. Oh yeah, there's definitely some Home Depot hardware. Doo -doo -doo. This might even actually be from AutoZone. Oh, they splurged. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys like the uh, custom crack in the uh, tub? That's awesome. It's high performance right there. Don't put anything you don't want getting wet in there. Don't put anything in there. Yeah. I have a tub. So there's your condenser and your fan. Yeah, here's some of your lines. Here's your condenser, or sorry, your dryer filter here. It's right there behind the wiper motor. So that's the low pressure switch, so, or the high pressure switch rather, because that's the safety as well, right? If that switch, it's a binary switch, open or closed. When the system pressure is too high, which it won't be, because we already checked it. Because even though the system pressure is okay, if that switch is bad, so it's the opposite of where it should be, that will also keep the, the compressor from kicking on and running. So it's just a quick check before we start digging into even further into the car. Yay. Wiper motor assembly out of the way. And then there's our pressure switch. Yep, right there. I can't get the leads on there because there's three small pins in there. So it's, yeah. Oh, they're touching the wrong things. Yeah. I can take the switch off and try and test it, but I'd like to see what the values are with you know, the pr with it on so, pressure. Yeah. So this is actually a trinary switch, not a binary switch. So it's three wires. So it will trigger either for high pressure or low pressure. Oh yeah. Since everything's kind of expensive to buy, we don't really want to just buy stuff in this right. space. Yeah, I'd rather not. But at least it's all opened up now. So. So you've got great access. Yeah. Yeah, we're there. That's what. That's one of the things people don't get with these cars, in my opinion, when they talk about how hard they are to work on because of, False. you know, everything's packaged so tightly. And it, it is packaged tightly, but you can't be afraid to take the car apart. They're designed yeah. to be. Well, once you pull off all the panels and tubs and whatever, you got tons of space. Yep. Like yeah. this is actually pretty reasonably spacious to work yep. on. Yep. Yeah, it's just people are stubborn and they think they can just stuff their hand in there and go for it. And so, you know, you got to take the time to disassemble it and then it's not too bad. Of course, that's why everything costs so much to work on it. Exactly. it's a lot of labor. Exactly. All right, YouTube, we will continue another day. The next day. Hello again, YouTube. Josh is back. And he oh. brought toys. We brought information. Information is good. Knowledge is power. It's the difference between fixing cars and being a dildo. Being a dildo? <laughs> so, no knowledge is dildo. Knowledge is... Have you ever found a smart dildo that thinks for itself? 
acts for itself, makes decisions? I mean, not really. Yeah, me either. They're usually pretty f ah. lifeless. They can be exciting. <laughs> yeah. We got a digital voltmeter and wiring clips and stuff. And the old manual. This is a factory training manual. So it tends to have a little bit more detail, a little bit easier to get to than the full shop manuals. Logic. Yes. Pressure switch tells the right hand engine computer that it's okay to activate the AC compressor and also advance the ignition timing and bump the throttle plates open to increase the uh, engine idle speed. Yep, yep. So it stabilizes and makes sure that the compressor is spinning at you know the appropriate RPM. And then that talks to the body computer, which talks to the air conditioning module, and then they reverse communicate. So there's through CAN bus, B CAN, C CAN, there's a continual loop of communication going here of checks and balances to trim the temperature, you know, trim the engine speed and keep everything doing what it needs to do. So here's a basic overview. Okay. Yep. Pressure sensor. Yep. Connector. Engine computer. Engine computer talks to the body module, so relay, fuse, connector, connector, AC compressor, and then you've got one ground here, which is just a chassis ground, and then your other ground will be for the safety over pressure switch. Now we've got a basic chain of command here. This is our pinout for the control unit. Okay. Connectors A and B. Okay. Now we've got a general idea of what signals are coming and going. Refrigerant pump. So this is what's really irritating about dealing with Italian stuff is because it's all translated. Is they is that the compressor? Uh huh. They will change the verbiage of things throughout the documentation. Refrigerant pump. Yeah, a compressor. Uh, yeah. Oh, here, a compressor there. It's a compressor there, and over here it's a refrigerant pump. That's why the you know for us in the English speaking world the the joke is is these are reference manuals. So we got the. The launch plugged in to the right ECU, AC fluid pressure. So that's the... That's our pressure switch. Okay. So 14.5 times 3.4. About 40 something, right? Sounds about right. That's what we were seeing on the gauge. So somewhere between here and here, it's saying no. Correct. Even though it's on. Yep, because presumably that should be adequate pressure. All right, so now we're in manual activations in the right-hand engine ECU. Yeah. So I can manually command the AC relay, oh, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. So this will confirm that we have an intact trigger circuit. If I hit this button and we get success, that means from the engine control module, pin number 44, we've got signal going to the SCM. It means our 30 amp relay is working correctly. It's got battery power. It's got, you know, signal here from the ECU. It's got ground over here where it's supposed to. The switch is closed. It's fed through the fuse, seven and a half amp, gone through both of the wiring harness connectors because we know that this has a dedicated harness on the engine. Right. And the AC compressor clutch is working and going to ground. Wow. So with this one test, we've basically, you know, figured out this whole circuit either is or is not working. So now we have another place to start diagnostically, okay. right? So we're going to hit this. Yeah. Okay, ignition's on. So when I hit this, we'll either yeah. hear the compressor clutch magnetically connect or not. Or not. Ooh. Hear that? Oh, yeah. Popped. Active test completed. Ooh, hold on. And I can hear it underneath. Yep. All right, do that again. Ready? Yep. Oh, yeah. You see that that couple? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, it moved. Right, so now it's on That's cool. That's cool. So now we know that the communication, as we just said, between the engine module, the body module, the wiring harness, the compressor, and the ground is all intact. Yay. And we believe that we've got a good uh, pressure signal here from the switch. Well, we got the, it showed 3.4 bar. Yep. So we really just want to verify that that's, you know, within specification. So we got to find that information in the manual, what its, you know, target pressure window is. 
uh, if it'll tell us. Otherwise, we just got to assume that it's good. 3.4 bar would be 50 PSI. That's what I said yesterday, right? We should yeah. have a natural resting pressure around 50. So we should be okay. So let's see if we can find a fault code here that would indicate uh, a pressure issue. So we have an EVDC fault and it's indicating we either have a blown fuse, bad relay, no freon Ooh. gas. No freon. Bad wiring connections or no proxy alignment. See, so this is saying where it gets kind of annoying is this tells us how much the load but it doesn't tell 30, us. So 630 plus or minus 30 grams of refrigerant. Oh, but it's just a quantity, not a pressure. Uh-huh. And that could be a fuse or a connector or a relay, it said. Yep. Well, we know it works because we just did a bench test. Wow. So now what we can try to do, let's go to actuation test. Let's see, compressor activation request, right? So we can try and do it manually. Mm. Ready? Yeah. Ooh, I didn't hear anything. Mm. Okay, so let's try actuator calibration process. Yeah, we got the EVDC again. Yep and left hand treated air temperature sensor and the research actuator. Okay. So you might have a wiring problem. Sure. There might be a wiring harness problem up there, right? Because if we go back to the EVDC. Yeah, it did say one of them could be a bad pin. So it says loose oxidized detached pins on AC compressor, NCL node, and on passenger compartment fuse and relay units. No continuity on the wiring harness connecting the compressor with the uh, air conditioning node, fuse and relay unit, fuse blown, relay blown, the and proxy alignment uh, for new compressor with EVDC, but device not installed in vehicle. Yeah, based on this, first you gotta go through, so this is just continuity checks to make sure that from pin to pin. Yeah, you got, got the right the yep. ohms, the right yep. resistance. Yeah, no opens and no high resistance indicating a wiring harness issue. And then visually inspect, which we already know the connector at the AC compressor is shoddy. Uh, it looks like shit. But yeah. since we went through and messed with it uh, through the engine control module, we can presume that the connector is good enough. Well, at least it's enough to kick on and off the clutch. Uh-huh whether it has too much resistance and it's upsetting you know the ac control module and going into a safety we don't know for certain but because we can activate the compressor we'll assume that that's not the problem and it's probably either a proxy alignment issue or a wiring harness issue up in the evaporator box which being that it had airbags blow out and the dash is busted inside that's probably all that a good place to start. Yeah, there's probably a wiring problem up there. And you also have multiple fault, right? You've got your treated air temperature sensor fault. Right, and we, the, we saw those weird temperature readings. Yep. Since yeah, the negative 40 on the evaporator sensor. So one would surmise that you've got a wiring harness issue up in the dash. And this is why we don't like to work on salvage cars. No. Yeah, where do, where do we go from here? straight to the trash bin where the fucking car should have stayed to begin with. Right. Just part it out. Get your money back. Call it done. I mean, it seems like it would have to be like one of the connectors on the unit, right? Nope. No. no, it could be the harness that connects to the sensors and stuff. Electric fan harness, air conditioning heating system cable. Cablaggio. Connection with AC vent control module. There's your connector to your um, control head, junction between AC unit and front wiring and passenger, up inside the dash for sure. So see if we click this one, because this one is junction between AC front unit. wiring and AC unit. So okay. this should be our primary power supply. Josh is in there trying to pop off the control unit, because we need to check the continuity between one of the wires on that and the EVDC, which is 
this thing right here is the EVDC. We've been getting some errors on that. This is the wiring harness for it. We're gonna check that that's working because we are getting an EVDC error. It's P or B1952. 2,000 years later. Okay, YouTube, we're gonna... <laughs> so, funny enough, we fixed it. And uh, we fixed it off camera because we thought, there's no way this will do it, and it did. So, uh, one of the things that the computer said that is one of the procedures to check on was to do the proxy alignment on the, uh, was the body control module, right? Yep. So, it was one of the errors we got, which was the EVDC error, and like it had one of the notes on it for a possible fix is redo a proxy alignment. Uh. Or no proxy alignment. TM proxy alignment. So, we did a proxy alignment on the body control module. If we come down to our PO 550, it, it was 19, it was 1952. There you go. Yep. B, EVDC. Yes. B 1952. The Cancel the error with the DS with the scan tool and see if it doesn't occur. And it did. Yep. So low battery voltage. We know we're fine there. Yeah. Okay. Make sure you got the software loaded in the NCL. Okay. Mm. Which we're just going to assume we do. Yeah. Then it's. Vehicle with proxy alignment for new compressor with EVDC, but device not installed in vehicle. And then you go into all the wiring stuff. Well, we skipped that and that yeah. was our bad. Well, in my opinion, no, because it's a f***ed up f***ing crashed car with bad f***ing <laughs> smash electrical connectors yeah. and a well, solder there's definitely job. Yeah, there's definitely solder exposed on the connector. Burn f***ing connectors. And so for me... I always do a, a physical check of, you know, yeah. the integrity first. So, yeah, I skipped their their order of operations and we would have saved like three hours worth of work. But oh, well. there are obvious visual defects. Yeah. So now we know for sure that we have good connectivity between the compressor and the control unit. And we have reasonable resistance in the cables. We know we've got good resistance on the coil to activate the compressor clutch. So... I mean, when you have a garbage car like this, it's easy to say, well, just push the button on the computer and do right, the alignment. Right. Then it's fine. It's like, okay, fine, I'll do that. And then in two days, you call me because your shit stops working again because there's a physical right. you know, fault in the car. And guess what? My appointment book is three months out. So now you got a quick fix. Two days later, your shit stops working and your next appointment's three months from now. Go f*** ah. yourself. <laughs> Or we spend a half a day and we do all the manual checks and we make sure the integrity of the circuit is acceptable. Yeah, well, the question is, how did it lose the proxy alignment? Because when it shorted, when it got dragged around by a forklift well, yeah. with no battery power. Well, I know, but after it was put back together, the guy who lived in Vegas, I believe, had the AC working. So at some point, I wonder, you know what? That exposed solder, I bet you that's shorting. It could have been. And that's yeah. causing the yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely put some heat wrap or something over that to make sure, sure it doesn't short again. Because because the one wire has exposed solder, the other wire is like crimped, and yeah. it's broken some of the insulation. So yeah. all it would take is those bouncing around just right. Sure. And it would short out. Yep. Yeah. So who that's knows? gotta have been what it was. I bet. Who knows? But well, that's my guess. P people are also completely full of shit and will tell you whatever they want. True. Yeah. Maybe it never worked. Down the, yeah. You know, they might have fixed that and then it still didn't work and they didn't have the software, yep. you know, and the foresight to do a proxy alignment and they just shrugged their shoulders and kicked it down the road. I mean, it is a convertible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. You know, the the amount of necessity of air conditioning in a convertible is kind of a funny thing. Yeah. What's more of a bitch move than driving around in your convertible with the top up and the air conditioning on? Like, come on, man. It's a Barquetta now. <laughs> Put the top down, unplug it. There you go. It's a Barquetta. So, yeah, so who really knows? It's hard well, to say, but definitely suspicious that, yeah, the connector's been smushed and the wires were broken and somebody did a <laughs> ghetto, just like everything else on this <laughs> car. The wire repair is ghetto because it's a not a very nice solder job and there's no shrink wrap or sleeving or anything. They didn't even cut the connector apart. And like, I mean, there's 14 ways you could have fixed that. And they literally took the path with the least resistance. But I feel a little bit better now that we know at least the primary circuit has integrity. We have a botchy repair that should be done a little bit nicer. We did the proxy alignment and now the air conditioning works. All right.
Yeah. We took the long path, but on a car like this, you have to. Like, well, you can't always go for the easy button. All, all that matters to me is it works. Yeah. Hey. Yay. We got an AC. Pizza and for everybody. It costs zero dollars. Fuck you, it did. You're well, getting a bill, mother Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, would have been. <laughs> I'd say you could no have. No parts. No parts. No parts. Yeah, there you go. No parts. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say technically you could have. I mean, I could have. Yeah, if I would have thought about that, I could yeah. have just done a proxy. But I, I would have never have thought about that. No, and this, so this is where like some of the remote, you know, diagnosis stuff that I can do on late model cars is handy because you don't have that right. information. Yeah, this is what I needed. I have I it. But first, we need to know if there's fault codes. Yeah. And then when we have fault codes, then I can go through and look through the diagnostic procedure. And then we can decide, you know, like, I know Dan's not going to, on his own, go through and pin out the wiring harness. No. Because you're a lazy DIY hack. Well, so I'm... whatever requires the least amount of effort is what Dan wants to do. So we say, <laughs> okay, fine. Push the button, you know, go into the body module, go into special functions, do the proxy alignment and see if it works. And then if it works. Right. From my standpoint, starting off, there was what, like 60 or 50 different yeah. uh, codes being thrown. So pff, like of yeah. all of those, I would have been like, oh, of course it's the EVDC code. Yeah. Yeah. Literally we had the DVOM, we had this computer, that manual and the scan tool all and all were required to figure this one out. Air conditioning, woohoo! Yeah, and it ended up being an easy fix for once. We're all like, shoot, we got that wonky evaporator, you know, sensor yeah. value. Oh. Like, ah, to get to that means pulling the whole evaporator out of the car. Like, that's oh, pretty laborious. I was laborious. scared that we're gonna have to pull the entire dash. I was like, no, it's a lot of work. So now we probably, I bet if we look now, those sensor values are probably okay because now we've. Man. Yeah, we've, well, and we've done whatever adaptation needed to be done on the control unit. Yeah, yeah, so basically we we've activated it. We should check that. I'm so, curious now. Ah, look at that. 20 degrees Celsius. Which is about right. Yeah, it's about 70 degrees out. Yep. And zeros. Oh, we still got a negative 40 on that guy. Yeah, that is interesting. I wonder if that's because it's not running. It's possible Ferrari does that sometimes where if the system's not operating, they'll do default values. They did that more in their early cars than these newer cars. So that might be a, a launch issue. Yeah, it could be the computer just doesn't like it. So there you go. That's part of the fun of doing diagnostics in a Ferrari, using unreliable tools with unreliable information to fix unreliable electronics. Why is my bill so expensive? Well, if you know an easier way to make up numbers that don't exist, let me know. There you go, you got air conditioning. Hooray, thank you. Yay. Thank you, Josh. Couldn't have done it without you, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. All right, YouTube, it's fixed. Thank you, Josh. Exotic-power.com. Exotic go there if you need his help. And if you want to send him complaints, you can definitely do it there. Oh, I love complaints. <laughs> I do some more stuff with this, so we'll be continuing to work on it. So like, share, and subscribe, hit the notification bell, all that good stuff. Check out normalguysupercar.com if you want to buy any parts or services from us. That's going to do it for this video. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for watching. We're going to be doing a lot of car stuff. So you're going to want to stay tuned. It's going to be sweet. <laughs> you're going to be doing a lot of salvage We're going to be doing title, a lot of stuff. stuff. we got a lot more stuff to go. It's <laughs> got a long ways to go.